Yeah, a GET exemption for food and drugs in Hawaii here on Talking Tax with Tom Yamachika. Uh, and we always enjoy talking to him about tax policy and taxes in Hawaii. Welcome to the show, your show, Tom Yamachika. Uh, thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, these days, there's been a lot of talk among the uh, political candidates, especially the one for the ones for governor, uh, about possibly adding a general excise tax exemption for food and medicine. You know, over and above the uh, the um, exemption we have now for prescription drugs. Uh, the three Democratic candidates for governor all support it, uh, and they are they, they have all articulated support for that. Is that so? It's a platform point for all of them. Mm, yes, it is. Now, uh, and, and the argument that most people make in support of that exemption is that the GET, uh, you know, Hawaii general excise tax, which applies to most purchases of things, including food and uh, over-the-counter drugs and medical services, is regressive. Thus, it falls more heavily on those who are not able to make ends meet. And of course, structurally, that's true. Uh, the GET is a straight percentage of the sales, so it doesn't matter whether the buyer is wealthy or destitute. It's the same percentage. Both rich and poor people need to eat. Both rich and poor people need to have their health taken care of. And some studies have shown that poor people spend more of their budget on such things. So that's 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 the issue. Uh, the counterpoint came uh, from Director of Taxation Isaac Choi, who pointed out in a recent Star Advertiser editorial that it, does, it doesn't necessarily follow uh, that the GET burden falls more heavily on the poorest because there is already a GET exemption for food bought uh, with Department of Agriculture, U.S. Department of Agriculture food benefits, like under under SNAP or the WIC programs. The state also provides income tax credits for lower income folks, one of which is called the food excise tax credit. And that's, that is, of course, meant to defray these costs. And uh, as, we, as we mentioned earlier, there's already a GET exemption for prescription drugs and prosthetic devices. And so uh, Mr. Choi reasons that a proposed broadening or the proposed broadening of the exemption to all food and all medicine or and and or medical services would primarily benefit the wealthy and the tourists mm -hmm. so so we can we can kind of talk about that well, we have often disagreed with him um you know one interesting point here it goes back to george freitas george freitas was the um the tax office leader for many years in informative times after uh, statehood. And uh, his one um, great initiative was to make the GET plenary for everything, covering everything. And, you know, there were these conversations back then to exempt this or that. But George stood firm. And at the end of his administration in the tax office, there were very, very few, if any, exemptions for anything from the gross excise tax. You know, and his, and his uh, argument, he had many arguments for this, but his um, primary argument is that once you start uh, taking a piece out of the gross excise tax, uh, it's a slippery slope. And politically, there will be pressure to take another piece in another area. Uh, how, what do you define as food? For example, a bag of fresh vegetables would probably qualify under most people's definitions of food. But what about a hamburger from a fast food establishment? Uh, there, there have been some Hawaii bills uh, that attempted to exempt food, but it would have excluded the hamburger uh, because it's prepared food and not groceries. Now, how well, about more, a 20... more about top sirloin steak? The sirloin steak then. If you have a hamburger that's exempt, uh, what about uh, a, a fancy meal at a fancy restaurant? What's oh, the tax. difference exactly? Uh, the, the the bill would have exempted groceries, but taxed prepared food. Restaurants, including fast food. Right. That's you know that, I think that's a, an easy division there. It's an easy demarcation. 
Uh, uh, but what what is it? What is the tax foundation? Your comments, I'm sure. Uh, if if there was a bill, there isn't right now. But if there was a bill um, to exempt food, uh, what what exactly would you say? What would your remarks be about it? Well, uh, there are several ways to draw the line. Um, if you want to exempt food, you can exempt groceries and tax fast food. You can tax restaurants, uh, but there are also arguments um, to exempt the restaurants and the fast food as well. Uh, it's obviously easier to apply a broader definition of food because then you don't have to you know, worry about the differences between prepared food and fast food. And then how, like, how would you classify a Twinkie, right? Uh, some, some people would be okay with uh, exempting real food and they, and they don't classify a Twinkie as real food. They classify it as junk food or something like that. Um, but this problem has come up in other states uh, many times. And because a lot of a lot of states have food, uh, you know, food exemptions or lo lower rates for food in their sales tax laws. Uh, now, I think the broader you make the exemption, the easier it is admin to administer, because then you don't have to kind of deal with the distinctions between real food and junk food or groceries versus uh, prepared food, uh, but at the same time, then it costs more. If you're going to, if you're going to exempt the restaurant meals, it's going to cost more than if you don't exempt the restaurant meals. And then when it comes to medicine, uh, most people will ex accept uh, prescription drugs, and we already do. Uh, Over-the-counter medicines that's you know that's that's probably considered medicine, like you know, aspirin, Motrin, Aleve, Pepto. They, are they exempt from gross excise right now? No, they're not. Over the counter, so only not. prescription medicines. Only pres only prescription meds and prosthetic devices. And then the question becomes: All right, what about homeopathic products, nutritional supplements that are believed to have some benefit but aren't scientifically proven? And what about illegal drugs or semi-illegal drugs like marijuana. I say semi-illegal because uh, the state legalizes it under certain, uh, certain conditions. Uh, the feds still have it as a Schedule One controlled substance. So oh, if, if I'm running a marijuana shop and I can legally with license and in Honolulu, um, do I have to charge gross excise tax on the marijuana? Uh, you probably should because you're being taxed on it. Okay. So, I mean, you know, zooming back for a moment, uh, we, it's very regressive, especially when you consider that it's on everything. And uh, you can go to other states and find that, you know, it's it, the rate is double uh, our our 4%. Um, but at the same time, it's there's all kinds of exclusions and exceptions. And I think over the years uh, since George Freitas, uh, the, the, the two arguments, the, the two reasons why we haven't made a lot of exceptions on um, gross excise tax is one, um, uh, as we have discussed, um, it's a slippery slope. Before you know it, there'll be more. Um, okay. But the other, which is inherent in that, is um, where we're not inclined to get into the weeds. We're lazy. We, we don't want to make these distinctions. We know there'll be litigation over it um, by retailers, what have you, who are selling things that they would they would like to be exempt. Um, but you know, I think that we ought to follow my view only. I think we ought to follow the other states that have made that division and are not being lazy about it and have um, made the distinction. Um, because of the regressive effect of the tax, to say that um, you know there's some kind of um, federal benefit on food for some people in the community is not enough. Uh, there are a lot of people who are um, disadvantaged who don't have those benefits, and uh, you know it's not it's not fair to have the regressive effect on them. 
I don't think food, I don't think food uh, should be, I mean, I'm not talking about restaurant food, but food that you buy has food in a, in a food store in a market, uh, that food should be exempt. I mean, it's a question of, um, you know, helping people who need help and not imposing a tax. If you want more tax revenue, then increase the income tax. But obviously, if you increase the income tax, you're going to have political pushback. And that's a third factor that works on focusing on uh, leaving the gross excise tax in place. Um, I, I, there's, a, there's an essential unfairness about this. And we are not really progressive as long as we leave it there. Yeah, the, the general excise tax uh, has been kind of a sacred cow in Hawaiian politics for a very, very long time primarily because it makes so much money. Uh, it makes uh, close to half of the uh, receipts of the, uh, the state general fund. That's wrong. It's taking it off the backs of the poor, and we ought to find another way. And the so, other thing is, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we should spend a little time today. I hope you're interested in that. I have to talk about that half percent in Oahu. Well, uh, yeah, we can talk about both both issues, um, but again, you know, uh, what you do about the tax is, I think, driven by, you know, the the desire of, uh, or the or the question of who to benefit. Okay, um, yes, there are benefits already in place for. The, the lowest income people, um, some of which I question, and 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 let me kind of digress for a moment. Uh, Director Isaac Troy was talking about tax credits, uh, you know, for the for the poorest of people. Well, that that assumes uh, that you know about the tax credit, uh, that you that you file an income tax return and you properly claim the tax credit. On the income tax return form, uh, a lot of our poorest people don't uh, don't know about number one and don't do number two or number three, and then the tax credit, of course, goes away after a year, uh, never to come back. So that's a that's a fair point that Icy Troy makes. On the other hand, uh, isn't that a matter of uh, educating people? Well, how are you going to do that? I mean, like you, you, you need, to, need to take uh, um, people from the Department of Taxation to the uh, homeless camps, uh, to to the uh, you know public housing, uh, you know, and again, who who is your uh, who is the audience you want to benefit from this? Is it just you know the poorest of the poor or you know, people who are genuinely struggling to to make ends meet, and there are a lot of those who, as you mentioned before, might not qualify under uh, WIC or SNAP, and you know, and get get the federal benefits. Okay, fair enough. But I, you know, in general, I think if you're going to impose a tax and give an exemption, you have to tell people. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously you're going to tell people, but uh, that doesn't always work. No, I mean, I, I know, I know from experience when I was working at the Department of Taxation, you know, we announced changes. Um, you know, people get confused. Okay, and and they make mistakes. A lot of them, and and, and more and more likely, they make mistakes when they are at the you know, disadvantaged economic levels. Um, you know, it's a structural problem in this state and, and other states, but we're particularly um, vulnerable to it um, because of the effect of the tax, because the tax is uh, plenary, and in many ways it's uh, too high. So I don't know what we're going to do about this. I mean, it seems that you say that the gross excise tax is politically sensitive because um, it, it derives a lot of revenue, half the revenue of the state. Okay, um, that doesn't make me feel any better. Uh, I, I think that if the state needs to raise revenue in order 
in order to do the fine tuning at the income tax level. Um, that that is a better way to do fiscal policy, isn't it? Uh, well, it's, it's more can... it's more progressive, but but the but the issue is that the income tax is already very high. Right? It's already either the uh, I think it's the second highest in the nation. Behind behind California. What's, what's wrong with us that we have this? What, why? Okay, why is it so high? Uh, it's the high one of the highest in the nation, and at the same time we have this regressive uh, gross excise tax. Where have we missed the boat on this? It sounds like our tax policy needs uh, some rethinking, don't you think? I mean, and throw in the fact that our uh, real property tax and real property is really the mainstay of many families. Uh, real property tax is relatively low. Um, so where are we missing the boat? Are we spending too much money? Are we mismanaging our fiscal, you know, activities and policy? I, I um, think I think there are strong arguments for both of those. Mm. Um, we're spending a lot of money. Mm. The, the the reason why, you know, taxes are so high in this state is because we're, you know, we're spending or attempting to spend a whole bunch of money. Uh, and even then, you know, with all the money we spend, we we can't get stuff done. Um, you know, look at the uh, you know the humongous wait list for Hawaiian homelands, for example. Um, it's been a problem for decades and decades, and finally, this legislature, you know, seeing seeing a bunch of extra money, uh, threw six hundred million dollars at it and see what happens. Uh, we have uh, backlogs in maintenance. Uh, at our airport, at our university, at at the schools, uh, you name it, um, and and I think this extends also to uh, county facilities like parks. Yeah, we're turning into a backwater, um, you know, a third world country that way. Just look at the roads, eh? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we can have a war on potholes every year, but it still doesn't solve the problem. Our roads need work. We have to, you know, fix them better so they last longer. Um, so anyway, I mean, that's it's, it should be obvious to everybody, although I don't think it is. And it should be obvious to somebody who is paid um, to make tax planning, tax policy and fiscal planning and policy so that we don't have this kind of imbalance that you described. Um, so from a, a call it a management point of view, um, aside from the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, who thinks about this all day, uh, what what organizations are um, in place that would address this imbalance? That's a very good question. I mean, within within our government, uh, you would think that the uh, the governor's office should be on top of this. I'm not sure they are. Um, the Department of Taxation is on top of the tax part, but not the spending part. That's not their job. Um, we have large agencies who do a lot of spending, like DOE, Department of Health, uh, University of Hawaii. Um, I, I'm not sure what motivates them to keep their costs down. And, and I think they have lots of motivation to uh, uh, to keep them up. You know, just to answer my own question, um, Les Kondo and the uh, state auditor's office, um, although it's a kind of a hit and run approach rather than a planning approach, uh, seems to me one entity that should have, it has had a lot to say about waste. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the state auditor's office has taken hits uh, from the legislature for political reasons, as we know from discussions with him on the show. Um, but the state auditor's office could be very important in, in the landscape of um, organizations which investigate and, and, and throw some sunshine on this, don't you think? Yeah, no, no, I think transparency has been a very big problem and it continues to be a very big problem. Um, especially in the larger agencies like DOE. Uh, there have been organizations that have been trying to get at uh, DOE's accounting system to make it more uh, accessible to the public. There was a lawsuit filed a few years ago to do that. I'm not, I'm not sure how far it's gotten. Um, 
uh, probably not very far at all. Uh, there have been advances in, uh, you know, the law um, mandating transparency of government operations. Uh, but then, you know, along came the pandemic and uh, all of that was kind of turned off. Mm. I want to talk about Neil Abercrombie for a moment. You know, uh, there was an event that took place at uh, the MIC, Manoa Innovation Center, during his term of office. And uh, I was there, and a lot of people were there. And he was talking about technology in the state, which is, you know, sort of a, uh, uh, it's a sad and disappointing uh, initiative. <clears throat> and um, he called me out among the crowd and he said, Jay, you like tech, don't you? Yes. He says, I'm going to make you so proud, you know, that uh, we are we are going to have the best technology for the state government that you have ever seen. They will come from miles around and extol the virtues of the new system we're going to put in place. Um, and um, we're going to bring the best technology and we're going to correct all the you know, ancient legacy systems that are, you know, being used and still being used in state government. I said, that's great. This is an open conversation now in front of all these people. I said, that's great, uh, Governor, but when? <laughs> and now he's he's really got to answer that. So he says, well, it's, you know, it's going to be by January. We actually named the date. <clears throat> and um, it was, it was a, a noble idea. Uh, I, I don't know if he had the, um, you know, the resources to do any of it, but he said he was going to do it. Well, that date came and went, and nothing happened. And we still have all this legacy software and hardware in state government. But let me offer the thought that Abercrombie was right. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a, a special task force public-private partnership, uh, where they brought this guy in uh, from uh, G GSA in Washington and um, put him in charge of finding out what the problems were and recommending answers. And he made a very big, expensive report, but the report was not acted on. Anyway, end of the day, it's still, it's still the case that uh, we could bring new software to make state government more efficient in every corner this is sort of like the special fund that you and I have been talking about, special funds. Um, it's in every little corner, there's different software packages, and they're not coordinated. And if they were, uh, gee whiz, things would be much, much more efficient. Um, but they haven't been. And I, I suggest to you, Tom, if, if we were willing to spend the money, uh, including with local software programmers and vendors, uh, willing to spend the money and put better software, more um, you know, interconnected network software around state government to all the agencies and all the little corners, uh, we would be you know lots more efficient and we would save money, and and um, some of the problems you're describing could be resolved through that methodology. Yeah, no, I mean definitely one of the. Uh, bugaboos of any large organization, including our state government and others, uh, is that that you get people in silos and they do and they want to do what they want. Uh, they don't want to be beholden to anybody else. But really, what what you need, or or what we as a society need, is is some unified plan, uh, which if at which when implemented would be way more efficient than what we have now. Um, you know, we've kind of done that in, in pieces, uh, but, but we still have, you know, software that, that doesn't talk to each other. We still have, um, uh, arcane management of maintenance backlogs, uh, such that, you know, stuff doesn't, doesn't happen in any kind of timely fashion. You know, what are we going to do about you know, all of these things, I think those are the some of the biggest issues that our state government is facing. And I'm hopeful uh, that whoever gets to be governor this time around is going to think seriously about it and 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 give us some great leadership to 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 deal with 
the, these types of issues because we really, really need that. Well, in the private sector, where ostensibly they do have resources to, you know, network their data, um, you know, they they can do planning by push a button. If I push a button, I can know the status of my company instantly. It's right there on the screen, and then I can sit with my team and we can figure out how to how to use that information, how to how to change that data, improve that data, what have you. We may not be always successful, but at least you know we have the data to work with. Um, it's like navigation, like the Hokulea, which I think you know talks about this, is you can't really figure out where you're going unless you know where you are. That's the first step. Uh, it's like years ago, um, I'm remembering uh, Earl on Zai was, uh, he was attorney general maybe at the time, and the question was, how many employees do we have in the state? And nobody could answer it. We didn't know how many employees we had, state employees we had in the state. I wonder what would happen today if we asked that question. How can you possibly plan things if you can't push a button and have all the answers on the screen and know exactly what the, you know, for example, the total of the special funds uh, is uh, and the total number of employees and all the data you'd ever want should be on the screen. And then you can sit as the executive branch, um, as DBED, as anyone, as the legislature, as the tax office, can sit and know the state of affairs any moment on a dynamic basis. If we had that information, I think we could do better planning, uh, not only on, on fiscal policy and you know more efficient government operations, but also on tax policy, don't you think? And maybe we could fix some of these tax imbalances that you and I were talking about. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Um, but, you know, we have some issues because, uh, you know, some of the big agencies don't like transparency. Mm. Uh, and and this, this, I think, is a, a, a problem common to, you know, many big organizations. You know, the... Um, you know, people who have who have a fiefdom uh, like to control it, and and they don't want you know outside inf uh, interference. So so they they guard their uh, they guard their fiefdom. They build walls. They don't want their walls penetrated, uh, and they they would view um, you know a system that you're describing as you know really a, a breach of the main keep and threatening. Very much so. Well, you got to begin somewhere. I, I don't think that Neil Abercrombie's idea is going to come true anytime soon, even though we had $600 million to give away last year. Um, that would have gone a long way to, to saving much more money in the long term uh, if we'd applied it toward uh, developing uh, local government technology as we should have done back in the day. Um, but query back to the main topic. What, what do you think we should do about these exemptions? Uh, it strikes me that, you know, we want to be progressive. We claim to be progressive. We need to be progressive. We have to think of all the people uh, who are disadvantaged and poor, uh, largely because we haven't managed land that well. And land is their most important, um, you know, obligation, their most, most threatening debt. And, um, for that reason, uh, the family budget in this state is always under pressure uh, from rent or mortgage payments. And so how are we going to help people achieve um, a kind of um, an even playing field or a more even playing field in terms of living their lives in Hawaii, not having to leave? How are we going to make a, uh, a life for young people who graduate school uh, how you got to do a little here and a little there and make life in these islands more progressive, more equitable, more just, more fair. And this is one way, in my view, to do that. And I don't know why, after all these years, we haven't done it. Uh, you mentioned before the show that uh, there have been bills from time to time in the legislature calling for this reform, but they've always failed. And here we are, 2022, 2023. Are we going to do this or never? You know, it's like that New Yorker cartoon. 
where the guy's talking to somebody who wants to have lunch with him, and he says he's leaning behind his desk, and he says, how about never? Is never good for you? Uh, and, and that's what happens. Is never going to be the answer here, Tom? Well, I think we, we, need, we need to kind of get the, uh, you know, the, the fundamental uh, question, uh, at, at least, uh, in, you know, discussed and and maybe make some decisions about how much government do we want? Okay. Can we pair it back to something that we can afford? And if we can, then maybe we can afford the exemptions that we're talking about. If we've if we're if we're you know staying the course with you know the, the big government that we have, the programs that we you know maybe um are nice to have but uh, are not essential, then we gotta pay for them. And and paying for them means that we gotta keep taxes high. Uh, and 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 and, and the you know, legislators are, are going to keep hitting the walls, saying, "Well, we don't have the money. We either got to raise more, or uh, we we have to sacrifice this, or we have to sacrifice that." And what do you, and what do you sacrifice? Do That's you sacrifice what some the of those people? very same uh, candidates are saying. I could name names, uh, you know. Uh, they have said this in the legislature for years. Um, we don't have enough money. We have to raise taxes and, uh, and we can't spend and all this. And so, I mean, I think ultimately it constrains our ability to grow and to build a, a livable, workable society. Uh, it's, it's very tragic because it all points downhill. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, this is, this is a hard spot we're in. Uh, I, but I would say in the short term, uh, the most important thing is to give confidence in the public, to make the, the public feel the government cares about them. And uh, this is one way that could be done. Yep, the, the, the very good thoughts. Um, well, we're, we're pretty much out of time. So um, uh, I, I, I thank you for the discussion about uh, taxes and food and medicine. Uh, you know, bringing them down is a good thing, but I think we also need to address the the root causes uh, that um, that make our government so big and and want to tax so many people so many different ways. I, I think we need to kind of think about relieving the pressure on the fisc so we can relieve the the fiscal pressure on the people. Ah, well put. An important an important idea, and I think it it really defines the, the you know the fundamentals of our state going forward and it also defines the fundamentals of uh, talking tax with tom going forward I, I would say tom we have enough material to keep on doing these discussions forever is forever good for you uh no i don't think so but we can go uh, for the next couple of weeks anyway <laughs> tom yamachika talking tax with tom Thank you so much, Tom. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.